thank you so much for ministering to me. I cannot tell you how much I love to speak into that kind of singing. All my life, corporate worship has cascaded over my head on the front pew as a pastor and has meant more to me than the people really could know to prepare my heart to minister the word. So thank you for doing your part. It was significant. I'd like to pray one more time and and ask the Lord's help. Father, we love the gospel and the truth that because you sent Christ to shed his blood, therefore you will not withhold from us any good thing. And therefore I can expect now that you will show up and bless these young people. And so I ask for your help to do that and count on it. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you. I'll strengthen you. I'll hold you up. That's your word to me and to them in Christ right now. And so we hold fast to it and lean on it in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been asking students and other audiences for years this question. Do you feel more loved by God when he makes much of you or when he, at great cost to himself, frees you to enjoy making much of him forever? Which prompts you to feel more loved? And I want to go beyond that question this morning. In fact, I want to explain a misunderstanding that that question has created and where the question comes from and then go at it another way. So I'm trying to do some adjusting here in an old question that's been very useful and and prone to misunderstanding. Um, The aim of that question is not to deny that God makes much of his children. So I ask, do you feel more loved by God when he makes much of you or when he enables you to make much of him? I'm not trying to play them off against each other, but it sounds that way. So before this message is over, I'm going to show you uh, maybe more than you've ever seen, I hope, how much he makes of you as his children. So that's my corrective. I don't mean for that question to be a denial of the biblical truth that God, astonishingly in his grace, makes much of his redeemed children. Let me tell you where the question was coming from and then head off in a a different direction and circle back around to what I've been trying to do all along. I care more about nominal, hell-bound Christians who believe God loves them than I do about genuine, heaven-bound Christians who don't feel God loves them. That make sense? I'm more worried about the first group. I'm I'm desperate to rescue the first group. The the second group are going to make it. That's the definition of what I just said. They're hell. They're heaven bound. They're going to make it. They're struggling along the way because they don't feel loved by God. Now I'm con- I'm going to talk to those people this morning. Some of you in this room. But I want you to know that that's where this question came from. This this question was aimed to try to help people discover what's at the bottom or the root or the foundation of their happiness. That is, are they born again? Is God down there or is self down there? Is the bottom of all my joy, is the joy of all my joys that I get made much of? Or is it God? That's what that question was aiming to probe into into people's lives about. 
let me try to analyze this just so you feel what I feel about my concern for the churches, my concern for campuses where a lot of people grew up in Christian homes and they're not born again. And they feel loved by God. What if you believe that to be a Christian is to turn to Jesus to get everything you wanted before you were born again? And what makes you a Christian is not new wants, but a new source. What if you believed that? Suppose... What you wanted all along was to be wealthy. And you hear a preacher and you turn away from yourself and you turn to Jesus and prayer and obedience to get your wealth. Or what if you wanted all along to be healthy and you stop being self-reliant and going to only doctors and you started praying and relying on Jesus for the thing you always wanted, namely health. But what if you always wanted to escape the pain of hell and you turned to Jesus in order that your body would not feel that kind of pain forever? Or what if you wanted a happy marriage or peace of conscience and you turned away from the world and you turned away from self-reliance and you relied on Jesus for a happy marriage? Would you be a Christian? All the desires remaining what they were before you were born again, just a new bellhop, a new butler. The meal is the same, new butler bringing it in. Does that make you a Christian? It doesn't. That's not what the new birth is. It's not leaving everything the same, all the same desires that you had before. The new birth is way more radical than that. So I'm probing, I'm digging into people's hearts saying, what's at the bottom of your joy? It's okay to want to have a happy marriage. I want to be healthy. And I turn to Jesus and I ask him and he wants me to. But he's not a cosmic Dr. Bellhop Butler to give us all the stuff we wanted before we were born again. The, the new birth is the awakening of a whole new range of delights, namely Christ and his glory and his fellowship. And if all your desires have stayed the same and you're just using Jesus to get them, you're not a Christian. You haven't been born again. There's nothing new in you. The root hasn't changed. And I'm concerned about people like that. And there are millions of them, I fear, who are in our, in our churches and, and on our Christian campuses. What makes a person new, what makes them born again is that they don't just delight in God's gifts, they delight in God. Jesus is not just a means to get what you always wanted as a dead, blind sinner, but he becomes your joy. That's what it is to be born of God. So when I said, do you feel more loved by God when he makes much of you or when at great cost to himself, he frees you through the new birth and the atonement to enjoy making much of him forever. I'm trying to separate the wheat and the chaff now so that it won't have to be separated at the last day. But it, it was so prone to misunderstanding, that question. And it, it, it set genuine believers, it sent them away kind of discouraged. And I, so I'm going at it differently now, all right, this morning. I want to talk, I want to talk to those of you in this room who are born of God. God is at the bottom of your joys and you struggle to feel loved by God. 
You're really, you're really saved. Something deep, profound has happened to you. And you are awakened. And Jesus is your all. You would die for him. Yes, you would. And you get up in the morning and you go to bed at night. And for whatever reason, Satan's hammering you, your genetic makeup, your parents, whatever. You do not feel loved by God. So that's who I'm talking to. Here's my new question. <clears throat> Why does God over and over and over again in the Bible describe his love for us in a way that immediately reveals he's loving us for his own glory. <laughs> Why over and over and over again does God say astonishing things about his love for us and his plans for us and his care for us and then adds on that he's doing it for the praise of his name? Because there's a lot of people who say, look, if he's loving me just to get glory for himself, he's not loving me. Or they say, if he's making much of me just so that in a roundabout way, I'll make much of him, he's not loving me. That's what a lot of people feel. And therefore, as they read the Bible, which is a very God-centered book, <laughs> they often come away scratching their heads. I'll just give you five examples of how God loves you, for God's sake. Now you, you, so this is kind of a test right now, and then I'm going to turn to the stunning news of his making much of you. This is a test to see how you emotionally respond to the way God protests his love for you. How you respond to this, okay? Number one, God shows his love for us by predestining us for adoption as sons. That's a quote from, I'll read it, Ephesians 1, 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. Now just pause there and let that land. From before the foundation of the world, God decided to make you his adopted child. That is off the charts amazing. That a human being, all of us sinners, could be embraced by God and brought into the very family of the creator. That's off the charts amazing. And then the next phrase says, I'll read it all again. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, do you feel deflated by that? Like, you were just telling me that I'm coming into your family. You were just loving me and embracing me and welcoming me and, and giving me an incredible privilege, and then you ruined it <laughs> by saying it's all to the praise of your grace. Do, do, do you? F I hope not. I mean, maybe there's just no problem in this group with this. So. I hope, I hope you don't say, that's a downer, that I was brought into his family for the praise of his grace. I hope that feels to you like part of the gift. Number two, he shows his love for us by creating us. You didn't have to be. And he brought you an eternal soul into being as an eternal soul, never to end, heaven or hell, here we come forever. It's amazing. To be is amazing. This is what it says in Isaiah 43, 6. Bring my sons from far, my daughters from the ends of the earth, everyone whom I created for my glory. Is that okay? He gave you the gift of being for his glory. Do you feel loved when he says that? Or is that kind of mess up love? Or here's the third one. God shows his love for us in sending a savior. Fear not. 
Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which shall be to all the people. For unto you this day is born in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts. What's next? Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Why? A savior has come. So we get the savior, he gets the glory. Great news of joy, a savior born for you. What do the angels say? God is glorious. A born again person loves that. A born born again person doesn't say, I think I should get the glory. He died for me. He came for me. What's all this glory be to God from the angel hosts? No, no, no. A born again person doesn't think that way at all. Their joy is in that response. I get the savior, I get the help, and I get the joy. He gets the glory. And it is my joy to say that forever. I mean, you sing it. Number four, God shows his love for us when Christ died for us. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Listen to how he says it. For the love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died. My sake, for my sake he died, yes. So that I would live for him, yes. (laughs) Well, is it for my sake or is it for him? And if you push those apart, you just don't get it. You just, you're missing the God-centeredness of the love of God. It is for me that he enabled me by his blood to enjoy making much of him. Number five, God shows his love for us in the way Jesus prays for us. How does, what does he pray for you? What's the ultimate prayer of Jesus for you? It's John 17, 24, following. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given to me, may be with me to see my glory. That you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you feel love when Jesus prays that for you? He looks you in the eye and he says, I have prayed for you. And what I want for you more than anything in the world is for you to be with me and see my glory. That's my best gift of love to you. It has to be so. He is infinitely valuable. The best gift he has to give is Jesus. He gives himself for our enjoyment forever. So my question is, why does God do that? Over and over and over and over again. That's just the tip of the iceberg in the Bible. Over and over again, he tells us he loves us. And he tells us in a way that draws the attention back to himself. His glory glory and his his grace. Why? Why does he do that? Now, I'm going to answer that question in the last two minutes of this message. I'm going to answer that question as clearly as I know how to answer it because I think there's an answer in the Bible. But this is the place where I want to um, remedy the misunderstanding of my original question. Namely, do you really believe he makes much of us? 
I mean, even what you just said in the last 10 minutes of this message kind of makes me wonder, Piper, whether you just, just don't feel kind of begrudging about all the good news and of how much he makes of us. And you're in a hurry kind of to get to God and downplay the astonishing statements in the Bible of how much he makes of us. So this is a remedy of that criticism. Okay? So here we go. I have, how many do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have seven ways God makes much of you. When I say you, I mean those of you who've been born again are in Jesus Christ by faith alone. Okay? So get ready to be amazed. And if you're not amazed, you're asleep. (laughs) If not physically, spiritually, which is not a good thing to be. I just read this morning my devotions. Be awake. Be strong in your faith. Act like men. And what was the last one? (laughs) Second, Second Corinthians 16. I forget the last one. But anyway, be awake. That's there. It's in the Bible. Number one. God makes much of us by being pleased with us and commending our lives. C.S. Lewis um, preached a sermon called The Weight of Glory. Adam Jacob says, best sermon he ever preached. And in it, what is the weight of glory that we can barely tolerate? What's the weight of glory in C.S. Lewis's sermon, The Weight of Glory? Here's a quote from C.S. Lewis. To please God... To be a real ingredient in the divine happiness, to be loved by God, not merely pitied, but delighted in as an artist delights in his work or a father in a son. It seems impossible, a weight, a burden of glory which our thoughts can hardly sustain, but so it is. Well done, good and faithful servant. God makes much of you, sinner, son, and daughter, by being pleased with you. Number two. God makes much of us by making us his fellow heirs with Christ who owns everything. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the You will. You will. The whole earth will be yours. Yours at your disposal someday. Totally. Romans 4.13, the promise to Abraham and his offspring is that he would be the heir of the world. To him and his offspring, you are an offspring of Abraham in Christ. You will inherit the world. So you don't need it now. Number two, three, third text, 1 Corinthians 3, 21. Let no one boast in men, for all things are yours. Whether Paul or Paulus or Cephas or the world, or life or death or present or future, all are yours, and you are Christ, and Christ is God. So he makes much of you by making you the heir of everything. The universe will one day be your personal playground. Number three. God makes much of us by having us sit at table when he returns, when Jesus returns, and serving us as though he were the slave and we the master. Listen to this most astonishing sentence of all the parables, maybe. Luke 12, 36. Be like men waiting for their master. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table, and he will come and serve them. That's not a picture of the Last Supper. That's a picture of the second coming. You sit down at the table. Jesus goes on the floor with a towel, off his white horse with a sword dripping in blood after decimating all your enemies, and he serves you. Four, God makes much of us by appointing us to 
carry out the judgment of angels. 1 Corinthians 6, 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? Any of you feel especially competent right now to take your seat upon a, a, a judgment bench and pronounce judgment on beings who are a thousand times more powerful than you are? You will. Number five, God makes much of us by ascribing value to us and rejoicing over us as a treasured possession. Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. Fear not, you are of much more value than many sparrows. Zephaniah three seventeen. the Lord your God will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Now we always celebrate in the book of Revelation our loud singing of the lamb who was slain, who is worthy. What will his voice sound like when he says, thank you very much. May I sing now? And he sings his love song over you. Number six, God makes much of us by giving us a glorious body like Jesus' resurrection body. Philippians 3, he will transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Matthew 13, 43, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Most of you in this room right now are not happy with your bodies, right? Very, very few people are, right? I'm old now. I get less happy with my body all the time. It's sad to be unhappy with your body at the beginning. You know, you're not tall enough. You're not shapely enough. Your hair's not right. Your complexion's not right. Your proportions aren't right. Nothing's right. You feel, man, if, I just hope you can get over that because you're going to shine like the sun. You will be so absolutely stunning, every one of you in Christ, so absolutely stunning. Nobody will be able to look at you except with new eyes which is why we have to have new bodies. We have to have new bodies not only because our old bodies aren't what we want them to be, we have to have new bodies because the eyes of the old bodies would be blinded by the other new bodies. That's what it says. Jesus shone, remember in Revelation, his face shone like the sun. We're gonna be like that. You go out and try to look at the sun. Don't do that, but if you, <laughs> if you tried to look at the sun, you would go blind. You will shine like the sun. You will. You little Trinity student who feels so insecure and so inadequate and wish you were another human being, you will shine like the sun. It's just a matter of time. I'm 68. It is just a very short time. <laughs> I can remember sitting where you were sitting. I went to Wheaton. Sorry. It's, but, <laughs> but I remember sitting in those chapels. It was like yesterday. Like, I just retired from 33 years in the pastorate. Where did they go? 33 days. So don't worry too much. God has assigned you your body, okay? Be okay with his gift. You've got another one coming, which will make all of us look like cinders here. Number seven, finally. Most amazingly, maybe, God makes much of us by granting us to sit with Christ on his throne. Listen to this. I'm almost, I'm almost afraid of these verses, lest they sound blasphemous. This is Revelation 3.21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. I'm afraid to comment on that because it seems to say, well, the comment I will risk is at least we're going to share the rulership of the universe with God. That's what throne means, right? Sit on a throne. It's going to be, don't think about a crowded throne. The point is throne, king, rule. You sit with me, I sat with him. So I'm in his lap, you're in my lap. We're ruling the universe together. Or another commentary from Paul on that, Ephesians 1.22, 
The church is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The Bible's language for how much God makes of you is extraordinary and beyond comprehension. So do you hear, we're going to leave in three or four minutes, do you hear John Piper saying, God makes much of you, more of you than you can comprehend, more of you than you can even dream. It would be worth a study to gather these together. Now, back to my question. Why does God over and over again in his word say things to that effect, loving things, stunning things of of affirmation and affection, and put it in the context of, and it's for my glory. Why does he do that? Here's my closing effort at an answer. It is a greater love to say it that way. It is a greater love to love us for his glory than if he made us the end rather than him. Self. God's love for us that makes much of us for his glory is a greater love than if he ended by making us our greatest treasure rather than himself. Making himself our end is greater love than if he only made us his end. The reason this is greater love is this. Self, even a glorified self, the one that shines like the sun in the kingdom of the Father, self will never satisfy a heart made for God. He sent his son to die that he might have you and that you might have him. He won't let you settle for happy thoughts of self. Not even a glorified self. He will not let your glory, which he himself creates and loves, replace his glory as your supreme treasure. So let me end like this. Glory in this truth. Glory in, revel in, bask in the fact that God loves you enough to say that he loves you for his glory. That way of loving you is greater than if he didn't love you that way. Or put it one more way that might stick. Children of God, you are precious to God, but you are so precious to God that he will not let your preciousness become your God. God will be your God, and that's what it means to love you. Let's pray. Father, I pray for two kinds of people now. One is the kind who came in without having been born again and at the bottom of their lives was themselves as the final joy that you would awaken them from the dead and put yourself at the bottom and make yourself the joy of all their joys. And then I pray for those, and I think it's the vast majority in this room, who are born of God, genuinely made new and struggle like all of us with feeling loved by God. I ask that you would use this message and these magnificent statements of of your love and your making much of us to break through the emotional obstacles that have been in the way and cause them to come to a new level of enjoyment of being loved by God. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.